Hello, everybody. Welcome to summer camp. Uh, we are live online and in person for this. Um, so over the years, we have been pretty involved in online discussions about all the generations of Miatas, and we were surprised to find that not everything on the internet is true, believe it or not. Crazy, right? Yeah. So in our seminar, we are looking to squash a few of these myths and misconceptions, or a myth conception, if you will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so our plan is to cover all of our myth conceptions in order from generations in somewhat of a Q&A format. Also, just as a disclaimer, we did our best to have everything on our list to be purely fact, but some of it is admittedly well-educated opinion from well-informed and or experienced people. Um, with that said, this is a casual environment, so if you have any questions or comments, feel free to chime in. What's our names? That's a fantastic question. My name is Ethan. And I'm Matt. We're both part of the CSR department, if you haven't guessed that yet. Yeah. This is true. I can confirm this. Okay. So, by a show of hands, who has heard that stock NA to NB head bolts are torque to yield, or in other words, single use? Okay. Oh, we got a couple. One or two. Yep. Yeah, sounds about right. So... We checked all of our factory service manuals, and nowhere does it mention that head bolts are torque to yield and or single use. So if you want to reuse those, feel free. Um, ARP head studs are a great upgrade if you have it apart anyway, but if you want to go with ARP or stock head bolts, that's perfectly fine as well. To mention as well, uh, back in our customer car days, back when we were building cars for customers, uh, we reuse those quite a bit and didn't have any issues. So feel free to do that. <laughs> um, next up, who here has heard and is still of the belief that the six speed from the NB will help fuel economy on interstate driving? That's an important topic, fuel economy these days. That's right. That's right. I don't understand fuel economy, but someone I'm sure does. So. Yeah, just as much math. It's hard. <laughs> so, might be a bit more well-known, obviously, since we didn't get any hands, but generally speaking, you know, sixth in a six-speed is shorter than fifth in a five-speed, so the engine will be spinning faster for a given gear and speed. So if you want to see for yourself, you can also check out our knowledge base article that includes our gearing calculator. Um, you'll be able to see what your results should be for pretty much any possible gearing scenario you could put in really any Miata, NAs, NBs, NCs, or NDs, and I believe the Fiats also are on there. Some people think that just because you have an extra gear, like sits gear, that it's always on top, but for this instance, they just threw an extra one in the middle, and it's actually like Ethan mentioned, uh, your RPMs are higher on, on highway speeds, so. Yep. yep. All right, so it might be a bit more controversial here. Who has had, or believed to has had, a timing belt skip teeth on their NA or NB Miata? Oh, Ooh. a couple folks. So, not necessarily saying you're wrong. Because <laughs> um, that would be bad. <laughs> Right, but in all of our days of working on NAs and NBs and all in our shop cars, um, we have never been able to confirm a timing belt actually skipping teeth. Um, a misaligned timing belt from installing it, you know, that's another story. Um, so, not necessarily wrong, but you know, as far as FM is concerned, that is a myth to us. What scenarios were your, I guess, forms that the Tommy Belt did skip? Idle tensioner, uh, it's too loose, and the uh, adjustment is not set correctly. So 
final tensioner was too loose and the adjustment wasn't set uh, correctly. So with those, that's very probable because it simply wasn't installed properly. So uh, if you go by the service manual, there are specific uh, settings for these and then hopefully everything's good. Season your. All right, on to NCs, Matt. Oh, so I get NCs. Um, so. NC lock, yeah. <laughs> we have some NC love there, that's great. So I'll be Woo. very careful with my questions. Um, <laughs> this is kind of a broad statement. Uh, has anyone heard heavily opinionated things about the NC platform throughout their years? Oh yeah. Huh, maybe? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> Maybe the underdog, uh, people don't like them for uh, reasons that they're too American, too big, too heavy, um, too fill in the blank. So, ah, <laughs> too awesome. That would be, uh, yep, that was a possibility also. Um, so for the weight situation, um, a little bit of data. The NC1 with soft top, does weigh less than dun, 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 uh, fully trimmed Mazda speed. So the NC1 is about 2441, and the Mazda speed is 2529. So I didn't realize that there was a lightweight NC before I started to do this research. So hey, I'm, I'm kind of becoming an NC fan um, in motion for sure this last week. So, um, so good to know there. Uh, more things on the weight. Um, people say, oh my goodness, you can't have the power retractable hardtop because it's so much heavier. Uh, it's about 80 pounds, so that's about uh, the, the comparable weight to a full tank of fuel and empty. So if you think that your car is driving significantly worse with a full tank of fuel, maybe this would affect you. Me, myself, I'm pretty happy when the tank's full. That means I get to the places where I'm going and my wife doesn't holler at me that I need to fuel the tank. <laughs> Um, let's see here. Ah, other things. I have heard that the NC was just a placeholder. Uh, Mazda didn't come up with anything good here. So, uh, right, I, I agree that it's not a very good statement. Not mine personally. The internet, always right. Mm -hmm. So, here are some things uh, that are great about the NC. And my information is coming from our rep from Mazda, Mazda Motorsports. Um, this person is very heavily interested in the NC platform. He races that, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so I pretty much just picked their brain on the good things about the NC. They mentioned, they're not just a placeholder. Um, actually, all of the front suspension and rear suspension uh, transferred into the ND platform. So if you think that is the superior platform, uh, you might thank its younger brother, the NC, uh, for that development of the suspension points. They're not exactly the same, but they are heavily introduced or developed and pushed over into the ND platform. Ah, the MC was the first Miata for the Global Cup Series, uh, so that's pretty significant. Uh, this, this person mentioned that, as far as he knows, that the NC is pretty much in as many sanctioned events as a car could be. So the platform uh, kind of has many fingers into the racing, uh, uh, racing series. More good things about the NC, just because they are larger and wider, you don't have to fight the broomstick test uh, when you're doing your autocross sessions. The, the people that struggle with that um, are pretty happy about that. Your race seats, that you can hardly only fit a few into NA and NBs without modifying much. Uh, fit very well in NCs, many more options for your race seat options there. Uh, uh, NC is probably the only platform that can uh, stuff the largest and biggest tires under it. So, yay raw. I think they're the highest horsepower off of the factory floor uh, to date. Correction, very close to the highest horsepower. And what else do we have there? Oh, so yeah, more things. Um, stiffer suspension, I'm sorry, stiffer chassis just by design without even any modifiers from us. They come from the factory, very stiff. 
Um, mm, so, is the NZ a real Miata? Well, my question is, <laughs> it's a convertible, it's classified as a roadster, it's fun to drive for the people that realize what it is, and uh, it's very predictable, so that equals a Miata to me. <laughs> Go NZ. <laughs> Mm. Oh, for sure. Good point. So GT people, uh, very, very good platform for that. You know, uh, you get to add a few more things in the boot for your pleasure. You actually have a separate set of socks and things like that instead of just wearing the same things <laughs> over and over again for events. Everybody's happy. Hey, we have a glove box. Ah, <laughs> glove boxes. That's getting over the top. <laughs> um, also, as a fun fact, um, the NB6 speed has shorter gears than the NC six-speed. Not a misconception, just fun fact for you guys. Five speeds are the same up until 2015. Shorter as in how? So shorter gearing in the transmission. So quicker shifts, possibly? Possibly. Good, good to know. Any other NC heavily opinionated things we need to have answers for? Yes. NC1 question, uh, rod strength. This is on a built engine or stock horsepower? Stock horsepower. Stock horsepower, are there any issues with rods? Um, I'm going to say I didn't do a whole lot of research in that area. My apologies. I think that would have came up with our Mazda comp person and I didn't hear it. So I, I would say stock power, you should be fine on that platform, so. Um. To add, um, in the NC2s, as of 2009, they did add forged crank and forged uh, rods, possibly pistons as well, I'm not too sure. Um, so technically a little stronger, technically a little smoother. So NC1s, if you're gonna boost them, you're probably fine. Um, but NC2s and NC3s are technically probably a little better. Gotcha. So the question was, are NCs less reliable uh, for the in, on the engine than the other ones? And I believe uh, Ethan just answered that. So yeah, not necessarily. Yep. Yeah, big horsepower might be a, a different situation. Yep. All right, no one's yelling and screaming, so we're going to move on to the NDs. Kind of the same question. Anybody hear any heavily opinionated thoughts, forum post on the ND platform? Anyone? 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 Yes. <laughs> so a lot of people say that the ND is uh, super compact on the inside, but I'm like six two and I can fit in it perfectly fine compared to the NA brand. So the question is, I am a tall person. Uh, I don't fit in the NDs, and this gentleman just says, hey, I'm a tall person, and I actually fit into the NDs uh, much better than the NA and NDs. The seat development, I think, is probably a huge benefit on the NDs. Uh, they're made out of different materials to keep everything nice and, and light. I do think you have more leg room. I didn't measure this. I'm sorry. So this is very opinionated. Uh, but hey, I have a real life person saying that I'm tall and I fit well. So good point. Yes. The question is, when you track uh, an ND heavily, um, is there an issue with the differentials, correct? Um, I didn't hear that from our Mazda reps. I do know that it is a good idea to have them properly cooled and like you mentioned, service regularly or possibly a little bit, um, you know, for extreme climate, we would say. So with those, I haven't heard of any um, huge issues uh, being uh, exceptionally weak. So kind of on that topic, how about the ND transmissions having issues? So the ND, yes. One more question. 
Oh, and they're going to politely wait. Thank you. <laughs> so on the transmissions, um, the early Indies, so Indy ones, I should say, uh, Mazda realized from their racing, um, racing Global Cup, oh, there we go, Global Cup series, uh, brought out some issues on third and fourth gear. Uh, a few of their racing departments figured this out. Uh, Mazda answered that pretty directly, and they had uh, newer, upgraded style third and fourth gears from Emco, I believe. So that solved that issue for the Global Cup. Shortly after that, um, heavily autocrossers were talking to their local dealers, and there was enough of them that uh, kind of brought the subject up to the director department at Mazda. They were having failures on second gear. So uh, Mazda, once again, uh, handled that, that issue fairly directly. I think once the director figured this issue out, uh, you know, the, the result was, we'll also warranty those. Um, I think he figured that out within a one day period. So that's pretty exceptional uh, dealing with the corporation. Um, and they, they knew that they were heavily autocross. So if anybody has read details and warranties standardly, um, anything off-road racing as in not street driving is usually not covered under warranty. So that just kind of shows you which we all know that Mazda is a pretty good company to, uh, to deal with. Ah, so more questions. I will have to pay this person $20 because he's leading to my next topic. So the question was, uh, there's still some issues that have been rumored about the transmissions in the later NDs. Hey, usually on the street, um, the normal public, like myself, daily driving, there hasn't been any issues um, with the ND transmissions. It's heavily tracked transmissions that we're a little bit more concerned with. And uh, I'll back up a little bit. Early 2016s, there was a VIN cutoff, and that's when Mazda sent out the TSB technical service bulletin to say, hey, if you are below this VIN, you might have some issues coming and see us. If you're above this VIN, you're probably okay. So, and for the aftermarket company, companies, uh, we do have case studs. So this is to help strengthen potentially heavily tracked cars that didn't fit into that early in the transmission situation. So. If you're just a normal driver, you like cool things, sure, throw the stud kit on. Um, we have them. Brandon will talk about that later. But for us normal folks, I think I would just be happy with, uh, with uh, it as it is from the factory. Yes? The question is, what was the failure of the transmissions? And we did try to get a little bit more in-depth detail about that. We didn't hear back from them. They were very gracious to do a, a, uh, a Zoom call with us. Um, but the follow-up, I think it might have been us that we just didn't follow through. Um, for the third and fourth situation, they did upgrade to an Emco gear set. I don't know exactly what they did for the second, second gear situation. Luke. question. So our car, Andy, that has the BBR turbo kit, it is an early ND. So that was in the, the, the potential issue of the TSB was talking about. And we didn't have any issues um, at all, really. I uh, have a caveat here. Uh, we were heading to Laguna Seca to do a torture test with the BBR turbo kit, and we threw all of our coolers on everything. And what we didn't want to have happen was hey, I guess this transmission does have an issue. So we went ahead and sent it out to Long Road Racing, I believe, and they did the proper updates that uh, Mazda was recommending. So we yeah. haven't had any issues there. That was a 15-hour test as opposed to uh, the track. Oh, yeah, so that was a 15-hour torture test that we're going to say, could that we actually have a video on or more details? There's a couple magazines up all of it. So pretty neat. Let me check my notes. Even more than this. Hmm. 
think we hit the transmission and the uh, pretty much drivetrain concerns pretty well. Do we, Ryan? Yes. One more. How about it? Question is kind of comparison comparing the torque curve on the ND1 and the ND2. We do have some dyno charts maybe on our on our website. Um, if you go to our exhaust, I'm pretty sure we do compare stock, the turbo kits, and an ND2. Um, of course, they might have our mufflers on there, but I think we can give a pretty good comparison on the torque curves, maybe this horsepower. Sorry, I can't remember the details there. Yes. Gotcha. The question is pretty much, when Mazda went to the electric power steering, was it better than um, pretty much a hydraulic system? Um, that's very opinionated. I think some people might think it's new. It, I don't understand it. Um, it's doing things that I don't like, so it's bad. Um, I don't know that that's probably the correct answer. I think if um, you know, if you kind of look at it and uh, see if it's doing the things that you're asking it to do. I have heard that it is a bit numb, but um, maybe in the future, those are the things that we could tweak, you know, with a, a module or some side of kind of CAM device to kind of tweak it to the driver's preference, which would be pretty cool, really. So you could have heavily assisted at low speed, and then, which I think they're kind of doing anyway, but you know, you can manipulate, manipulate it to your preferences from an aftermarket uh, module possibly, so. I don't think electronics are bad in this, this situation. Ethan? So, just kind of covering some general misconceptions we've heard. Um, for one, for you track racers out there, um, who has ever heard of like a uh, ABS system going into ice mode on the track, or who has ever experienced that? One more time. Not on the Mazda platform, but. What is ice mode? Good question. So ice mode is essentially when your ABS system um, thinks it's on slippery, uh, slippery road surface, like ice, wet, snow, something like that. Um, and it wants to keep the wheels spinning, more or less. So it'll take brake pressure away from all four wheels, kind of make you slide. So in hot conditions, like if it's a 100 degree day and you're mashing on the brakes after 100 mile an hour straight or something like that, um, you could trick your ABS system, in a sense, into thinking you're on ice or snow or something like that. So. In more detail, um, yeah, I, Ethan's pretty much hit the topic there. Um, the computer doesn't understand when you're on uh, heavily tracked conditions where you have sticky tires and really aggressive pads. So it is the inputs, let's see here. Uh, it's getting confused on the de deceleration rates. So it is computing that you're actually sliding while you still have traction. So it's starting to do its ABS process, which does ABS things and irritates drivers. So um, the Mazda comp person said, you pretty much, you can't hack the system it's a black box from Bosch that they don't have any information on. It's all secretive. So you can't contort maps or anything in there that we're aware of, that they're aware of. So you pretty much have to drive um, up to its abilities um, by tuning your brake pads. So I don't know that I would tune my, my, my tire compound. I always like really sticky tires, but if you tune your brake pads, run up to the limit of the ABS, and then, you know, as a professional driver, <clears throat> not myself, um, that would be quicker. 
I think uh, the question is, is that more prevalent on a certain platform on the Miatas? I didn't ask that question specifically. Um, let's see here. I think there might be heavier manipulations of ABS systems as it evolved, evolved through the generations. I do know that I was quite surprised on my 94. I did a CTSV swap because I don't drive well, so I thought more power would be better. And I was pulling up the rear tire, so I thought I would do a, a clutch back differential. So I did a CTSV swap. Of course, I lost my ABS at that time, and I was having difficulty stopping. Imagine that, because my ABS system wasn't working. So I asked my friend, I said, hey, you know, do you use the ABS in these braking zones? He's like, no, I don't feel the ABS happening at all. So I told him to pull his fuse. He went back out and smoke everywhere. So even though you don't feel the brake pulsating, it's doing manipulations for your benefit. So it was kind of a, a neat experience for myself that I didn't realize um, I was uh, doing, I suppose. So ABS, as much as racers claim they don't like them, um, it definitely helps the last times if you work with it. So. Is it for specific generations on the, on the ice conditions? I think it could probably happen on all generations, but maybe more prevalent on others. I don't have good information there, sir. Yeah. I think the more involved, the smarter the technology is, maybe the more involvement it is to the to the driver. So then we get fussy about it. So. Uh, the question is, do you lose braking ability when ice mode happens or the ABS is supposedly taking over? Um, I think from a driver's perspective, you feel like you're losing brake, but uh, I don't know about you, but computers seem to be a bit smarter than myself. So while you think you're losing pedal pressure, it's really giving you all the pressure that you need to stop at a certain distance. So. Good question. What do you experience when this quote unquote ice mode happens? Obviously, when the ABS system starts to activate, you know, you get this pulsation. Um, I think the ice mode that's most troublesome uh, on the racetrack is well, maybe when your pedal starts to fall towards the floorboard. I haven't exper experienced that, um, so I don't have a good reference. But when you're starting to lose pedal pressure from the driver's perspective, uh, that gets a little bit nerve wracking. I'm sure some of us with just normal brakes have boiled the fluid and you get the same situation and it doesn't usually end up with a very good result. So <laughs> too much excitement on the racetrack. Is that that's the way I spoke. All right. So who here and or in internet land um, is a fan of shock tower braces or who has heard some misconceptions about shock tower braces? All right. Our friends in the corner over here. Sure. Yeah. So the question is, um, in essence, um, do rear shock tower braces have any benefits and do front shock tower braces have any benefits? So, uh, yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, the rear is already a pretty stiff area. It's flat sheet metal, basically. Um, so you're already pretty stiff in the rear. So a rear shock tower brace on a Miata probably isn't going to do much. Um, those are probably more for like a strut car, like a a lot of times you'll see them in like a hatchback Honda Civic or something like that, um, where there's a lot more floppy area in there. Um, for the front specifically, on a Miata at least, there is a big open area where there's really no real chassis stiffening. So having a, an actual shock tower bar with rigid mounts can give you benefits in stiffening up the front. So benefits in steering feel 
um, as well as just a general stiff feeling just while driving. Is so, this one rigid? No? It is not. So this probably isn't going to do much for you um, since it kind of defeats the purpose of having a rigid part in the front of your car. It still has a bolt through there, so you could tighten it up. But there is a, a very yeah. prone slippage there. So. so for that reason, this is the towel rack in our shipping department's bathroom. <laughs> still pur purposeful. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we found a good purpose for it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so they're all kind of the same um, in terms of how they're made. That might be the be not the best way to put it. So they all have a flat piece of sheet metal, fairly thick piece of sheet metal um, near the rear shock towers. So on a Miata, any generation really, a rear shock tower brace isn't going to give you any benefits. It's more just for show. Mm -hmm. For the fronts, yeah, absolutely, yeah, because it's 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 closing up a gap is what you really want to see in any sort of chassis stiffening modification, um, and it's closing a big gap where there really isn't much structural components. Wheels. So I have large eighteen-inch wheels, and um, that means all of aftermarket brakes would work, right? Uh, Maybe not. So it's important to understand where wheels interfere with cal potentially calipers on aftermarket setups. Um, just because you, it's not really the OD of the wheel. It's going to be where the barrel, where the, where the veins come into the barrel, where you have your lug pattern. Uh, that's where it usually contacts the, uh, the brake caliper. So sometimes on our 10-inch kit on the rear, there'll be contact there while 11-inch will fit on certain wheels. A lot of people ask us, hey, will this wheel fit with your brake? And if we haven't tested it in house, which we've done, I think, three test wheels in our house, we usually say, we have this handy tool. It's a template on our website that you should print off and double check. So Ethan has, this is actually a template of the wheel, which is opposite of what we have on our website. We have a template of the caliper on the website. But same situation, uh, always use the template, no matter if you're running 22s or 14s. Go ahead. Good point. Um, it was mentioned that just because the, you use the template like we suggest and it clears, your tire balancer might put weights in a place where there won't be weights when you leave the shop. And I think I've done that here. Usually on the six piston um, fronts, you have to kind of strategically put them someplace. So did you have a question next to you? question is, can you run the Cobalt three-point on NAs and NBs with crews? We don't support uh, Cobalt. I think three-point is pretty sweet, though. I mean, you can see that uh, through the manufacturing. You know, they, they'll bring that into the NC platform, definitely the NB platform. So that's definitely a good benefit. Um, sorry, I don't have a direct answer there. Yeah. Besides test and see, you know, that always. You know, so the cruise module on the NA is, is, can be remotely mounted. So that's a nice option there. We do that with our turbo kits. We have a little bracket to move it around to get it out of the way. So even though the bracket position might be an interference, uh, make a bracket or something. How are we doing on time? Everybody's still here, maybe. <laughs> I'm boring too much. 15 minutes. Kyle, do we have any internet questions that we need to uh, address? Not at this time. All right. Sure. How about sure. What do you like and not like about a 2.5 engine swap on the engine? Do you want me to handle that one? So, um, a 2.5 swap. So, our rep from Mazda Motorsports. The uh, question was? Yeah. Uh, so the question was, uh, what do we do and do not like about a 2.5 swap on a NC? And for the uninitiated, 
Um, there is a kind of a large line of Duratec and MZR engines. So you can have a two liter, 2.3 and 2.5 engine. Um, and those are out of like Mazda 6s, Ford Fusion, something like that. And they're basically bolt in to an NC chassis. Um, our Mazda Motorsports wrap, um, he mentioned for uh, racers, uh, for the most part, they often like to use the 2.3 crank um, in a 2.5 block since the 2.5 crankshaft is not forged, so better for high RPM and better for high power, technically. Um, other than that, yeah, we don't have a ton of experience with a 2.5 swap as far as we're concerned. Um, so. I do remember mentioning 2.5s were good for, you know, casual, um, road courses and stuff like that. If you're really dedicated, high RPM, then you know a two, a custom two liter with fancy bits in there is, is better for RPMs. Two five is not well balanced for high RPM. So everybody might think you know more volume, more better, but not not always. Where are we at, Ethan? Um, oh, Kyle had questions. No? Sorry. I don't have any questions. Kyle has all the knowledge. He has no questions. Here we go. So I ha do I need a huge pile of fancy parts to do any track events? So we probably get this question more often than not, and it, it's a bit intimidating for someone trying to have more experience with their car. Uh, I would say the track is a great place to, to experience this. For one, you don't get tickets, and uh, uh, safety factor. So uh, you definitely get to push your car, even in stock platform. So I would say you, you don't, as long as you can keep the cooling down and you have adequate brakes, I would say as long as you're up to the maintenance that you have on your vehicle, go out and enjoy it. You know, you don't have to be the fastest one to get involved in autocross, you know, some, some type of auto event. So you don't have to be a full-blown racer just to jump out there. So experience it if you want to. I think it'll actually help you, your daily driving too, uh, be a little bit more responsive and, I don't know, um, maybe avoid accidents, unless you're an aggressive driver. It might influence that, so <laughs> your choice. Uh, so in other words, uh, put some oil in your car and you'll probably be fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, with the knowledge we gave you, we do have a fairly uh, well in-depth knowledge base on our website. If you go to our main website, there's um, a little knowledge base link that you can click on. We're continuing to grow this just for the community. Uh, it is very factual. I would say very factual, slightly opinionated. That's just because we have opinions on the products that we support, uh, the other products that you might like. We might like too, but we just haven't um, you know, tried them out. So go ahead. Is there digital copies of old, older generations for our parts or factory manuals? Factory manuals. So that kind of gets into copyright situations, and our friends at Mazda Comp might not be our friends any longer if we did that. We do have some factory manuals at our fingertips if you're in a bench, if we've talked to you before, or if you catch us on a nice day and don't take a lot of our time, then we're more than happy to leak through that for some basic troubleshooting. Uh, we definitely don't want to be um, you hold the screwdriver at this end type of people. So, good question. Are we done yet, Ethan? Please tell me we're done. Uh, I think that just about covers our list. Do we have any other general questions or myth conceptions to cover for the class? Yeah. sales in general for Mazda's kind of output of manufacturers. So the question is how are Mazda's, how the sales pretty much, right? That information, boy, I have no idea. Um, we don't buy too many vehicles from the dealer. I think we probably should buy one more coming up pretty soon. So yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know. That's more like uh, maybe ask your dealer. Yeah. 
I do know that the Fiat 124s aren't selling real well. So. They look good for some of us, but unfortunately. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, I think we can con conclude this. We definitely appreciate you hanging around. Hopefully it wasn't too awkward for everyone. Uh, Ethan and I are, are not professionals in this environment as in presenters, but we do have a little bit of knowledge um, with things that go around and around. So thanks for hanging out.